Good morning and welcome. I am so glad that you are joining us for this time of worship. You know, we're still living in that glow of the Christmas season. Uh, we have been reminded once again, but still even every day reminded that Christ, He was born 20 centuries ago and He came to be our Savior and the one who gives us abundant and eternal life. Yet He is also the one who is Emmanuel, who is God with us every single day of our lives, helping us in our difficulties, walking with us as our companion, answering our prayers, and working all things together for our good. Uh, two quick announcements. Number one, on January the 31st at 1230 in the afternoon and following the late worship service outdoors, our congregation's voters assembly and congregation will gather we have one purpose in mind. It's exciting. It's exhilarating. We plan to extend a call to bring on a new pastor to our congregation. You're all invited to participate in that meeting. Uh, there's also going to be a dialogue on uh, January the 24th at 1230 in a congregational meeting. You're uh, certainly encouraged and urged to be a part of that too. And if you can't make it in person, we're making arrangements to connect with us by way of Zoom uh, if you are able to do that. Just call our church office for more information that you would like to have on any of those two matters and meetings. One other announcement too, and that is today we're going to be offering the opportunity to you to celebrate the Lord's Supper and to participate in the Sacrament of Holy Communion. It's going to come a little bit differently in our service than you typically have experienced in the past. It's built into the very end of our service. Uh, for those who would prefer not to participate and partake of communion today, you're going to be able to kind of bypass that and basically uh, complete the worship service with a blessing uh, after the sermon, the creed, and the prayers of the church. And those of you who would like to hang on and participate in having communion at home, uh, we'll give you the simple instructions that go with it. In the meanwhile, you might want to make sure that you have some bread and some wine available for you to partake of Holy Communion in your own household today. Well, let's move on to the things that we're gathering for in this time of worship Let's join our hearts and our minds and our spirits together as we would give praise and glory to the Lord, our awesome, loving, caring, and compassionate God, who is the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. May His glory shine on us, His love surround us, His power fill us, His grace free us, and His Holy Spirit unite us. Amen. These words of Holy Scripture, which serve as our call to worship, for God, who said, let there be light in the darkness, has made this light shine in our hearts so we could know the glory of God that is seen in the face of Jesus Christ. Let us worship Him who is immortal, who is wise, our only God and Father, and His Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Accessible here from 
Join your hearts and minds with mine in this opening prayer. O Lord our God, we acknowledge and confess you to be our good and great shepherd. We praise you for your mercy, thank you for your tender loving kindnesses, and revere you as the God of our salvation and the sovereign Lord who has control over all things. You meet our every need. You have, through the life, death, and resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ, pardoned our sin, reconciled us unto yourself, covered us with your grace, and credited the holy righteousness of Christ to be our own. By your own will you have made us, your beloved children, sons and daughters, upon whom you have lavished these gifts and all of your heavenly treasures. We thank you and praise you, deepen now and enliven our faith in you, instill your divine guidance in our hearts, and empower us by your Holy Spirit to freely, joyfully live lives that honor and give you fame and glory in all things. And we pray and ask this through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And now this scripture praise from Psalm 145. Great is the Lord, He is most worthy of praise, His greatness is beyond discovery. Let each generation tell its children of your mighty acts. I will meditate on your majestic glorious splendor and your wonderful miracles. Your awe-inspiring deeds will be on every tongue. I will proclaim your greatness." Everyone will share the story of your wonderful goodness. They will sing with joy of your righteousness. The Lord is kind and merciful, slow to get angry, full of unfailing love. The Lord is good to everyone. He showers compassion on all His creation. All of your works will thank you, Lord, and your faithful followers will bless you. They will talk together about the glory of your kingdom. They will celebrate examples of your power. They will tell about your mighty deeds and about the majesty and glory of your reign. For your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. Your rule, you rule generation after generation. The Lord is faithful in all He says. He is gracious in all He does. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like never before, O oh my soul, worship Your holy name. It's a new day dawning Time to sing your song again Whatever may pass And whatever lies before me Let me be singing when the evening comes Bless the Lord His holy name Sing like never before Oh my soul I worship your holy name You're rich in love And you're slow to anger Your name is great thousand reasons for my heart to find. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my 
The epistle lesson comes from St. Paul's letter to the church in Philippi, the second chapter. These words of instruction immediately follow what has been called through the centuries the victory hymn of Christ. Christ humbled himself and became a servant. And Paul's appeal is that we, Christ's followers, should have the same kind of mindset. Put into action God's saving work on your lives, obeying God with deep reverence and fear. For God is working in you, giving you desire to obey him and the power to do what pleases him. In everything you do, stay away from complaining and arguing so that no one can speak a word of blame against you. You are to live clean, innocent lives as children of God in a dark world full of crooked and perverse people. Let your lives shine brightly before them. Hold tight to the word of life. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel for the second Sunday after the Epiphany of our Lord is taken from St. John, the first chapter. One of the two who heard John speak about Jesus and call him the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, and followed Jesus was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his own brother Simon and said to him, you have found the, we have found the Messiah, which means Christ. He brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, so you are Simon, the son of John. You shall be called Cephas which means Peter. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, 
We have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nathanael said to him, Can any good thing come out of Nazareth? Jesus said to him, Come and see. Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him and said to him, Behold, an Israelite indeed in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael said to him, How do you know me? Jesus answered him, Before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Nathanael answered him, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Jesus answered him, Because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree. Do you believe? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, you will see heaven open and the angel of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. This is the gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God and praise be to Jesus Christ. Amen. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the St. Mark's Kids Chat. Um, today we are going to be in John chapter 1, verses 43 through 51. And it's all about when um, Jesus surprised Nathaniel. So let me ask you something. Have you ever been surprised by something? Mm -hmm. Yeah, what have you been surprised by? Um, the Nintendo Switch that you gave us. Oh, yes, you got a Nintendo for Christmas. That was pretty exciting and fun, right? Mm -hmm. so, um, so this lesson is really about how Jesus um, surprised um, one of his followers named Nathaniel. So last week, let's kind of rewind a little bit and re review. You know, <laughs> last week, um, we were talking about how John baptized Jesus, right? And what did that, what did that mark the beginning of? Um, uh, it marked the beginning of... Yeah, like his, his ministry, right? A new, a new be yeah, his ministry. I mean, meaning he was going to go out and start teaching people, right? Mm -hmm. So a uh, part of that, getting ready to go and do something like that, is you, you want to go out and you want to get followers to listen to what you're talking about, right? So this lesson is, is about that. When um, Jesus was going out and he was um, gathering followers, you know, he had already by this time um, found Andrew and Simon Peter and Philip. And guess what Jesus told Philip? So um, Jesus told Philip, follow me, right? So is that something that someone does when you want them to come and do something with you or learn something from you, right? Yeah. So um, Philip was so excited that he went and he told his friend Nathaniel. Um, and this is what he said to Nathaniel. He said, um, we have found the, the one that Moses and the prophets were all talking about in the law, right? So because Jesus was um, like a prophecy that had come true, right? Mm -hmm. So we have found Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. So remember back in those, back in those days in the law, it said that um, the, the Messiah would come from the line of Joseph, right? So Nathaniel was like, okay, and he says, he said this, it was kind of a weird response. He said, Nazareth? Who, or can anything good come from there? So he was thinking, he was talking about the city, the city of Nazareth, because remember he, they said that um, Jesus of Nazareth, right? So yeah. why do you think that that was confusing to them when, when, he, when um, Nathaniel heard the word Nazareth? Why do you think mm -hmm. that? Any thoughts? No. Where, where was Jesus born? Bethlehem. Bethlehem, right? So in scripture, it says that the Messiah was going to come from Bethlehem, right? But did Philip say that to Nathaniel? No. Who, where did he say that um, Jesus came from? Nazareth. Nazareth, right? So he was kind of like, number one, you're not, you know, saying the right city in my mind, so I'm not sure if I believe you or not. Um, and number two, um, Nazareth was a city that was not really well received. They, people um, didn't exactly respect the people that lived in those cities. There was kind of like a Roman influence there. So they were kind of like, Nazareth, ooh, some of the people that live there are not, you know, really great. So, um, so that's why Nathaniel responded in that way. But nevertheless, Philip said, um, I want you to come and see, which is the same, similar to what Jesus had told him, right? Come and see or follow me, right? So um, Jesus, so Nathaniel said, okay, well, I'll go with you. So Nathaniel went with Philip and, and Jesus saw Nathaniel approach him. 
And this is what Jesus said to him. He said, um, here truly is an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. So all of a sudden you're walking, you know, Nathaniel's walking towards Jesus, right? And he's like, you know, Jesus responds as if he knows him, right? And Nathaniel says, how do you know me? And Jesus said to him, I saw you while you were still under the fig tree before Philip called you. Whoa, pretty crazy, right? Mm -hmm. So, and then Nathaniel said, Rabbi, which means teacher, right? So, yeah, or teacher, it means teacher. So, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. So, let me ask you something. Have you ever wondered if your mommy, sometimes this is something that things that people say, if your mommy has eyes in the back of her head <laughs> like this, right? Mm -hmm. What about Max? Does Max have eyes in the back of his head? Turn around, Max. Does he have eyes in the back of his head? No, what do you so. think? Have you ever wondered why you think that, oh, maybe mommy or Sawyer has <laughs> eyes in the back of his head? So have you ever wondered that, you know, sometimes I'm doing something and then I didn't realize that my mom actually saw me or she actually like heard something off in the distance and I didn't know she heard me. Have you ever wondered if mom has eyes in the back of her head? Hey. Yeah. But like, have you ever wondered that? Have you ever been like, oh, wow, mom actually saw what I did and what I said. Have you ever thought that before? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Probably. Yeah. So some parents, some kids think that about their parents. Like so, Netflix. yeah, so so how how did Jesus know that um, Nathaniel was sitting under a fig tree prior to Philip coming up to him? How do you think? He knows everything. He knows everything, exactly. So we're going to do a quick little demonstration about that. So come on down here. Okay. So, all righty. So we're going to do, come on up here, Maxi, so they can see you. Okay, so what we're going to do is we are going to do a little um, a card demonstration. So you guys can see in here, right, this is, I'm going to show everybody at home, this is just a, a shuffled deck of regular cards, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to have you choose a card from this stack. Can you choose a card from this stack? Don't show her, Max. Yeah, I, oh, yeah, and actually, when you when you select it, that's a good thing, Sawyer. I'm um, glad you mentioned that. I don't want you to show me. I'm going to take my eyes away. And then, Sawyer, I want you to write down. Don't show me. And, but, Max, I want you to show the people at home, okay? Show the people at home. And then turn the card over and set it here so I don't see it. Did you show the people at home? Yep. Okay, set it right here. Sawyer, did you write down the card so we don't forget it? Um, did, so we look at this card and then write down the number, say if it's like, a queen of hearts or whatever so like write it down so that we don't forget it and then flip over your notepad okay are you done yep okay that way we don't forget it just on just on accident so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna restack all of these cards right here and then I'm gonna put Max's right here on top of it okay and then I'm gonna take about oh I don't know like a, a handful of these cards and I'm gonna cut them like this cut it like this okay so now, Max, what I want you to do is I'm going to flip this over. And I want, actually, I'll have you, sorry, I'll have you do it. I want you to cut it exactly in half. So take half of them and stack it over here. Can you do like that there? for me? Yeah. Set it right here. Okay, perfect. So we're going to do this. All right, so you cut it to the king of diamonds, okay? So what I'm going to do now is I am going to count out a handful of cards, okay? So I'm gonna count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13. <gasps> Was that your card that you selected? Yes. Whoa, pretty wild, right? Did I surprise you by being able to find this card? Yeah. yeah. So I, the reason why I demonstrated this is that you know, sometimes God does things that are kind of unexpected, right? We have absolutely no idea how he did it. We have absolutely no idea how he was able to see Nathaniel at the fig tree, right? And so I have a question for you. So when Nathaniel prior, you know, when Nathaniel said to Philip, you know, um, he said, Nazareth, can anything good come from there? How do you think Jesus would have felt if he heard those words in person? 
How do you think he would have felt? Mm, what if they said Max from Windsor? Nothing can come good from there, right? <laughs> like, would you be kind of be like, hey, that's not very nice, right? So that wasn't a very kind comment for him to say. So it's interesting, though. So um, he surprised Daniel. Or not, excuse me, not Daniel. He surprised Nathaniel. Excuse me. <laughs> he surprised Nathaniel and by saying that. So then he realized, oh, wow, like he actually did see, you know, in here what I said about him, right? So did, do you think Jesus heard what he said about how nothing can good can come from um, Nazareth? Yeah, I bet you he did. So, but you know what? You know what he said after that? Mm-hmm. After um, Jesus, um, you know, saw that he, Jesus replied to him and said, you believed because I told you I saw that you were under the fig tree, but you will see greater things than that. And then he listed off some things that were going to happen in the future that were going to be even more amazing than him knowing that he was, you know, under the fig tree, right? Mm-hmm. So let, this gives us a good little lesson to remember that even though we try to hide our bad behavior, right? Mm-hmm. So like, you know, we thought that, you know, by not saying it in front of Jesus, oh, can anything good come of Nazareth? Um, but Jesus saw it, right? Mm-hmm. So God sees everything we do, including the bad behavior that we do, right? So, um, you know, it's, it, but you get, yeah, but guess what? God loves you no matter what. And he sees everything. He sees everything we do, good or bad, but he loves us no matter what. So I want you to keep that in mind. All right, everybody. Have a good day. Bye-bye. You give life. You are love. You bring light to the darkness You give hope You restore every heart that is broken And great are you, Lord It's your breath in our lungs So we pour out We pour out our praise, it's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise to you only. You give life, you are love, you bring light to the dark. You give hope, you restore every heart that is broken. Great are you, Lord. It's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise, pour out our praise. It's your breath.
Grace to you and peace from God the Father, our Creator, the Giver of all good gifts, and His Son Jesus Christ our Lord, who is also our Savior and companion and friend, the Emmanuel who is always with us, and the Holy Spirit who has birthed faith in our hearts in the Father and in the Son and in the accomplished work of Christ so that we belong to the family of God and He will hold us in the true faith till the end of our lives. To the Father, Son, and Spirit, we give honor and praise and glory now and always. Amen. This morning, I'm really tickled to launch us into a five-week sermon series that I'm going to title FOR. F-O-R. Yeah, it's that simple. And over the coming weeks, uh, I'm going to take a look with you at what the Bible says about God being for people and how He is for people, people like you and me, people like those in our families, our church family, our neighbors next door, our circle of friends, and really everyone who is around us in this world. We also want to take about a look at what that means, therefore, as disciples and followers of Jesus, of looking like God, sounding like God, and acting like God for other people in our world our families and our friends and our neighbors. We want to take a look at that too. And our gospel lesson for the day, uh, which was read a little earlier to you by uh, Al Kruger, our elder of the day, uh, out of John chapter 1, we hear uh, Nathanael asking Philip, can anything good come out of Nazareth? And I have to admit that in the world that is around us today, you know, that, that great big vast world, they're taking a look at the church. And, and, and though the church is, you know, two and a half billion people on planet Earth right now, that they're taking a look at us who believe and who are followers of Jesus, and they're asking basically the same question. They're just using different words. And today, they look at that church and they ask, can anything good come out of the church of Jesus Christ today? And really getting right down to where this question meets the road and connects with you and me, we are being challenged to answer the question, can anything good come out of St. Mark Lutheran Church, Santa Rosa, at 4325 Mayette Avenue? Of what value are they, this church, to the neighborhood and to the community and to the world around us? What do they stand for? What do they try to do for the good of other people? Are they a closed-knit group who will only share their blessings amongst themselves? Or are they for us, who are their neighbors in the world? And I suppose, just as importantly, it is good for us to ask the same question about us individually. What are we for? in terms of being like God who is for our neighbor in the world and for the members of our family and the community? What are we for in terms of doing what is good and valuable and helpful to them? So I want to take an honest look at that question that they're asking about our congregation and uh, the several hundred believers and followers of Jesus who have knit themselves together in the power of the Spirit right here at St. Mark Lutheran Church. And I want to take an honest look of what this all means individually for each and every one of you. What is St. Mark Lutheran Church for? And what are you for as a member of the congregation 
and more importantly, a member of the large community of believers that call themselves Christians. Today I want to specifically look at the idea of what we are for in terms of sharing the blessings we have that God has given to us as our creator and giver of good gifts. He calls us and has made us even his dear and beloved children. We are for sharing the blessings and the joys that are ours because of that fact, because of that truth that he is for us as his beloved children because we are connected to Jesus by our faith and baptism. And I want to take a look at this meaning for doing everything that we can to help people get connected with Jesus Christ because we have experienced a transformation in our lives to something that is extraordinarily good, something extraordinarily glorious, something that is full of power and, and, and divine gifts. And, and it's the result of our deep connection with Jesus. And we want to be able to share those things with the people in our community. We want to be for them in that sense. In our text today, uh, we hear that Philip was impressed by Jesus uh, to the point that Philip figured out that, you know, this guy is the Messiah. This guy is the one about whom Moses, in all the books that he wrote, and that, were, that was the first five books of the Old Testament, which had a tremendous number of prophecies about who the Messiah would be and what he would do and what he would be like, as well as the prophets who did the very same thing, prophesied about who the Messiah would be and what he would do, be, do that was for people, and Philip was absolutely convinced that Jesus was that guy, that fulfillment of prophecy. And the first thing that we see Philip doing then is he goes out and he finds his buddy Nathaniel and says, Nathaniel, you got to come, you got to see this guy. He is the Messiah, he is awesome. And I think what really impressed Philip as he looked and observed Jesus and watched him and heard and listened and saw what he did, is that he understood that Jesus was the one who would bring redemption and would, was even then redeeming people, bringing forgiveness of sins into their lives, making people right in their relationship with the eternal God and Father, and establishing a relationship with Him who is the Savior of the world. I think he also saw in Jesus the one who is transforming lives, uh, taking people out of the bondages of sin and the powers of evil and bringing them into the light and into the grace and the mercy and the love and the kindnesses of God. And that would transform their lives. It would change them and it would bring to them extraordinary gifts that even you and I enjoy as members of the family, things like not only the forgiveness of sins, and the promise and hope of heaven and eternal life, but peace and, and tranquility and stability and confidence for living. You know, we know that our Lord Jesus Christ has our future in His hands. We know that even as we move into our future, that He walks beside us, that He is our comforter and our strength and our helper. And that allows us to face life with a confidence and a boldness and without anxiety or fears or doubts and just move on into life that has been designed by our Creator that is the abundant life that is promised by Jesus. And we get to enjoy all of that. So Philip saw in Jesus this Messiah, this, this one who would be Redeemer and Restorer and the one who would transform us. Form us. And he immediately wants to introduce his maybe best friend, Nathaniel, to Jesus. And I just love that because that really is the model that we ought to have when we express the thought that we are for our friends, like God is. That we are for the members of our family. That we are for our neighbor in the world and the whole world around us. You know, that we're for them in the sense that we want them to experience 
the redemption of Jesus, the forgiveness of Jesus, the peace of heart and mind of Jesus, the, the stability of life and the hope that we have in Jesus. We want them to experience that. And so, in that sense, we want to be like Philip, always introducing our friends, always telling our friends to, hey, come on and see, take a look with me. I, I love it that Nathaniel, who is noted historically as being maybe one of the most well-educated of the disciples, uh, he was a little bit of a skeptic at this point, wasn't he? But that's because he must have been well-informed and therefore a student of the Bible about what the Bible says about the Messiah. I'm guessing that Nathaniel already knew because of his study of the Scriptures that the Messiah could not come out of Nazareth. And so when Philip says, hey, it's the Messiah, he's Jesus from the town of Nazareth, Nathaniel goes, wait a minute, that doesn't work. Nothing can come that is good out of Nazareth. It's got to come out of Bethlehem. That's what the prophets said. That's what they foretold. The Messiah would come out of the city of David, which is Bethlehem and Ephrathah. And so Nathaniel is just using his, uh, his wisdom and his education to say, hey, uh, it doesn't look like this guy could possibly be the Messiah. And I love it because Philip answers, well, just come on and see. Come on along with me. Let me introduce you to this guy. And see, when it comes to introducing people to Jesus so that we can express the idea that we are for them and we are for the idea of sharing all the blessings that we have because of Jesus with them, we don't have to have all the answers to the questions. We don't have to have a, you know, a, a long um, list of pages that uh, have the scripting of, of our theology or all the facts about Jesus. Based on what we know about Jesus, based upon what we have become experienced in receiving from Jesus, that, that restoration of life and that forgiveness and, and that transformation, we can just say, hey, I have found in Jesus that he is the life changer, the life transformer for something extraordinarily good. So come on along with me and take a look. Just come and see. Uh, there is a great story that I happened to run across um, a couple of years ago. It's called uh, The Two Umbrella Christian. And it's a true story. Um, you can read about it in a number of biographies and personal stories, but it's a story about, primarily, two umbrellas. And uh, I want to encourage you to be a two umbrella Christian. Okay, I don't know if you noticed, but I have two umbrellas here to use as kind of little props as I tell you this story. Uh, there's a fellow by the name of Dr. Gordon Targerson. Uh, he's a Baptist from Worcester, Massachusetts. And he was crossing the Atlantic Ocean by ship quite a few years ago. And he noticed uh, on several different occasions as he would walk around deck that there was a dark-skinned man sitting on the deck, in a chair, reading a Bible. And every time he walked past that place on that particular deck, he saw that man reading that Bible. So one day, Dr. Targerson decided to stop. And he sat down beside the guy and he said, Hey, uh, forgive me my curiosity, and especially if I'm interrupting you, but I'm a Baptist minister and I happen to notice that you seem to be a very faithful reader of the Holy Scriptures. And I just wanted to stop and say hi and, and meet you and find out who you are. After introductions were finished, the dark-skinned man said, Well, I'm a Filipino, and I was born into a good Catholic home. I went to the United States as a young man to study in one of your fine universities, intending to become a lawyer. Well, it happened that on my very first day on campus, a student dropped by to visit me. He wanted to meet me because I was brand new. And he welcomed me and he offered to help me in any way that he could be of service to me. And then he asked me, interestingly, where I went to church. And I told him, well, I'm a Catholic. And he explained that the Catholic Church 
was, well, kind of a far distance away, but uh, certainly he wanted to make sure that I could get there, so he sat down and he drew me a map with the names of the streets on it. I thanked him for it, and then he said, have a good day, and he got up and he left. On the following Sunday morning, it was raining. I decided to, well, just skip church. I didn't want to walk to church in the rain and get all wet. But then there was a knock on my door, and there stood my new friend, and he was holding two umbrellas. And he said that he came by because he was worried that I might not be able to read his map or that it might even get wet in the rain, and maybe that I would even be discouraged by the rain and not go to church like I thought I would. So he said, I brought an umbrella for you too, and I'd love to escort you to your church. Well, he hurriedly got dressed, and thinking all the while how unusual this person was, very, very thoughtful and very kind, and he kind of started wondering what kind of a church that he might belong to. And so as they walked along under the two umbrellas, this man, this dark-skinned man, asked them about his church. And he said, well, my church is just around the corner, but that's not important. And, uh, but I suggested that maybe we would go to visit his church since it was so close and right around the corner. And then the following week, together, we could go to my church. And he agreed. He thought that was just a great idea. But somehow, this man said, I felt so much at home and so welcomed in his church that I never got around to finding mine. After four years, I felt that God was leading me to become an ordained minister. And rather going back to my old church in which I had grown up, I went and I studied at Drew University Seminary, and I was ordained as a Methodist minister. Then I returned to the Philippine Islands where I had come from in order to serve my people as a Methodist minister in a Methodist mission congregation. And then this man concluded saying, my name is the Reverend Bishop Jose Valencia, and I happen to be the bishop of the Methodist church in the Philippine Islands. Pastor Valencia, by the way, died in the year 1994. Yeah, not that long ago, at the age of 96. His legacy is one of being for those who had never been introduced to Jesus. He was for those who had never had an opportunity to connect with the Lord Jesus Christ. He was also for doing everything he possibly could to feed hungry people and to alleviate the severe burden that was on the shoulders of poor people. He worked relentlessly through the course of his ministry, journeying tens of thousands of miles on foot through the Philippine Islands, or perhaps on horseback, or occasionally by canoe down a river or a boat, in order to go to all of the areas of the Philippines for the purpose of serving Jesus, serving the unchurched, serving the poor, the disenfranchised, serving especially those who were not yet connected to Jesus in their lives. But I want you to catch that the real hero of this story is not the bishop. Important though he was, a marvelous missionary, a marvelous preacher of the gospel, one who shared Christ with thousands and thousands and thousands, the real hero of this story is that anonymous young man who had two umbrellas. Whether they ended up at the Methodist Church or the Catholic Church doesn't really matter. Go all the way back to the beginning of Christianity and its history, and you will find men and women who are the men and women of two umbrellas. They are the ones who are for people, who are for introducing them to Jesus who are for doing everything they possibly can in order to connect Jesus with those people. 
They are the men and women of the two umbrellas, winsome in faith, builders of bridges of friendship with one another, but also, just as importantly, with Jesus. And when they build those kinds of bridges with new friends and their acquaintances in the world, well, a bridge is also automatically built for Jesus, the cross, and to get to know them and to bring them into a relationship with him that goes on forever. See, Philip was a Christian of two umbrellas. And he was simply asking his friend Nathaniel, come on and see. I don't have all the answers to your question, Nathaniel, but I just want you to come and see this extraordinary one whose name is Jesus. And that's the simplicity of what you and I can do in the world too is we are for people and for doing our best to connect them with Jesus Christ. Just doing our best. Sometimes that means that we're praying for them. Sometimes it means that we, with them, are praying for them. Telling them right then and there, let me pray for you in order that the Lord Jesus would come and be a help to your situation. He will help and He will make a difference. Sometimes it's by sending a card of encouragement and building a relationship with neighbors or friends. Sometimes it's getting on the phone and having a conversation that encourages them to have hope. And they soon want to know why is it that you and I have such hope and we get to tell them it's because our hope is always anchored in Jesus Christ and He is ready and willing to have a relationship with them as well that allows them to anchor their hope in this extraordinary God and man who is Jesus Christ. So my friends, whatever it is that you want to say, you know, be one who says to the world, come and see, come and join me, meet my Jesus. He will make all the difference in your life. Or whether you, want, you call yourself a Philip, who is always introducing best friends to Jesus and praying for them, or whether you want to call yourself a two-umbrella Christian, just go out there and do whatever you can, everything possible to be for those people in your life to that end. In the name of Jesus, we ask it, and to His glory, we pray that it will be our experience and bring great joy to the people in our world around us, but also to our Lord and Savior, in whose name we do it. Amen. And may the peace of God, which surpasses our human understanding, may it keep our hearts and minds in faith, in Christ, unto life everlasting. Amen. It's now our opportunity to speak about our faith in our awesome God, who is Father, Son, and Spirit. We are going to today use the words of the Nicene Creed. Join your voice with mine. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of His Father before all worlds, God of gods, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again according to the Scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen.
Let us now join our hearts and minds together in this time of prayer. We pray for ourselves, for our family, friends, and loved ones, for our neighbors in the world, for our fellow members of the household of faith, and for all people everywhere. Heavenly Father, Abba, God who is love, our Good Shepherd, keep us safe in our travels and in our daily tasks. Watch over and keep in your care our loved ones and friends who are apart from us. Heal the sick, strengthen the weak, sustain the weary, repair the broken, renew us physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. Bless and give success to those who are caring for us and keeping us safe, and for those who are establishing peace within our midst. They are the first responders. They are firefighters and policemen, deputy sheriffs and sheriffs. They are the men and women of our armed forces whose duty it is and whose service to us is to care for us and to keep us safe and in the peace of the Lord Himself. Bless us with government and leaders who are eager to serve your purposes in the world and do your will for the good of all people. And so overwhelm us with the enormity and indestructibility of your love that we will be moved in our will and aided by your Holy Spirit to love you, to love ourselves as you love us, to love our neighbor in the world as well just like Christ does. So in love, Father, we pray that you will grant to us and to all people everywhere all that we need in order that our lives be sustained day by day as we would do our best to serve and worship you in gratitude for all you've given to us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Into your hands we commend all these for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And now, according to His promise, and as He has taught us, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be Thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Receive now this blessing and benediction. Jesus Christ is the light of the world. He has shone upon you, that is, that he has entered your soul and your heart, and he even now lives in you. Let His light now show forth from your spirit that the world may see His light, His love and His peace emanating forth from you. And this will finally lead them to give praise and glory as they see Him at work in your life and through you in their lives. And may Almighty God, who is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, keep you in that light as well as His truth and His everlasting love now and always. Amen.
As we prepare for this Holy Supper and communion with Christ, let us confess our sins unto Him, that He would remove the barriers of all that would keep us apart, assure us again of the forgiveness He grants freely for the sake of His Son, whereby He reconciles us unto Himself and He makes us one. O Almighty God, Merciful Father, I confess to you all my sins and iniquities with which I have offended you. Be gracious to me for the sake of the sufferings and death of your Son, Jesus Christ. Forgive me all my sins and grant me the will and the strength of your Holy Spirit that I may be enabled to live out my life to your praise, honor, and glory. Amen. The good news that comes to us starting with Christmas, but really for every day of our lives, is that God Himself came into our world in the person of Jesus Christ. Christ gave up His life in death on a cross and thereby became the means by which our sins are forgiven. And not our sins only, but the sins of the whole world. For it was the whole world that was redeemed and reconciled to God through the blood of Jesus Christ. And by His divine power, He rose from death, destroying the power of death and evil. He promises that by that same power, whoever puts their trust and hope in Him shall have their sins forgiven, be made the beloved child of God, be given abundant life now, and eternal life in heaven to come as a gift. His mercy and grace extend to all who fear Him, the Mighty One Himself, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit has declared this. Amen. My soul praises the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. Holy and great are You, O Lord. Endless is Your mercy, and eternal is Your reign. You sent Your Son, born of the Virgin Mary and of the Holy Spirit. We now wait for His coming again to share with us in this meal all His living presence and all His heavenly gifts. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Our Lord Jesus Christ, the same night in which He was betrayed, took bread And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying to them, Take and eat. This is my body, broken and given into death for your sins. As often as you eat this, do it in remembrance of me. In the same way, also after the supper, he took a cup, the cup, the cup of thanksgiving. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. For this cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of your sins. So as often as you drink this, do it in remembrance of me. His table is now ready, and Christ has invited you to dine with him in this moment. Receive the gifts he offers. 
Partake of the bread and the wine, in the body and the blood, and may the peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. So take and eat the body of the Lord Jesus Christ, broken and given into death for your sins. Take also and drink the true blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, given and shed for you for the remission of your sins. And may this body and blood of the Lord Jesus Christ now strengthen you, preserving you steadfast in your faith, and keeping you in the grace and the love of God, now and unto life everlasting. Amen. And now this final and closing prayer to both the Holy Communion and to our time of worship. Loving God, we thank you for hearing our prayers for feeding us by way of your word, for filling us, Lord Jesus Christ, with your presence and power in this holy meal, and for encouraging us in this time of meeting together in your name and presence. Take us and use us now to love and to serve you and all people everywhere in the power of your Spirit and in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.